Hello and welcome to the Mountain Gazette Library. I'm John Buzar, and this week we proudly present the writings of Sadie Stein, writer, editor, whose work has appeared in the New York Times, the New Yorker, and the Paris Review, as well as many others. Enjoy, enjoy the great American West, what's left of it. October, on top of Half Dome, the whole Sierra was blanketed with a foot of snow. I had just entered a pleasantly empty subway car. And the next thing you know, you're in this calm, calm water. When you know who you are, when you get in touch with yourself, you don't have choices. So I think as a journalist right now, you have a lot of opportunity to really put across quality work that will stand out in a sea of a lot of garbage. If I've learned anything about life balance, it would be that the no balance balance is where it's at. <laughs> Episode 5, New York is for the Birds, a portrait of New York's Audubon Society written by Sadie Stein for Mountain Gazette 194. When I first moved here from a more rural area and people talked about Central Park birding, I rolled my eyes a little says Todd Winston, a writer, birder, and the communications content manager at Audubon, New York, Gotham's chapter of the Audubon Society. It seemed typical of New Yorkers who think they have the best of everything. I don't understand how intense it is because of the saturation. We are in Central Park's Ramble, the meandering 36-acre bit of man-made wilderness accessed from the 79th Street Transverse. Winston, a respected guide known for his skill at birding by ear, has been kind enough to let me join him on his first Central Park bird walk since the start of the pandemic. And from the get-go, the saturation is apparent. Even in fall, a strange and confusing time to bird per Winston. Due to some of the species' faint markings, there are cedar, waxwings, robins, warblers, ruby-throated hummingbirds, nuthatches, sparrows, and juncos, as well as the odd red-tailed hawk, the celebrity of Central Park's birding world. After hawks started nesting on the late Mary Tyler Moore's Fifth Avenue building, the actress came to their aid. Winston keeps a running tally in his head to write down later. Many birders log their sightings as they go, or chart them in real time on one of the many birding apps. And naturally, there are a few rats. As with all bird watching in Manhattan, the oxymoronic term urban nature itself, the experience is characterized by its contrast. By night, the ramble has long been a byword for anonymous encounters and potential muggings. But this morning, it's picturesque, as quiet and gray as a Chris Van Alsberg painting. And although it was not early by birding standards, we meet at 7.30. The ramble is serene, a world from the bustle of the West End Avenue. However, just as looking for birds sharpens one's senses to their presence, so, too, do you become aware of other birders or birdies. Quiet, of course, distanced, naturally, and masked, it's a discreet population, but like confederates, they make themselves known to each other. Saw a goldfinch, says one young man by the bow bridge. Did he hear about the woodpecker in Queens? Ask a woman in passing on their path near Belvedere Castle. Apps like eBird mean real-time sightings are constantly updated. Others keep to themselves. The practice can be as social or as solitary as you wish. The famous density of birding here, that intensity, is due to a phenomenon known as the Central Park Effect. The park, because it's an oasis on the migratory path, a spot of green in a sea of inhospitable buildings, has an unusually high number of species in a very small space. In addition to the migratory birds, there is a large population of locals too, making for a certain kind of bird-watching nirvana, no matter the season. The Central Park effect benefits humans. I'm not sure how it benefits birds, remarks Winston. In the spring, birders in their own sort of Central Park effect typically converge on what amounts to a few blocks of winding path. Indeed, some observers have even suggested that proximity to people makes native birds and even 
repeat migrators friendlier and easier to observe than most. This year, though, was quiet. The problem with talking about birds is that even at the best of times, it lends itself to many easy metaphors. There's the fraught language of non-native species and resources. There are nests and flocks and homing insects. There's mating songs and plumage, of course, and the dynamics of feathering nests and waiting for eggs to hatch and the early getting of worms. There's the monogamy of penguins and the gender fluidity of flamingos, hawks and doves naturally, and all that is to say nothing of the putative return of the bald eagle to New York City. I won't use that term canary in the coal mine. Audubon New York City Executive Director Catherine Heinz says at one point, stopping herself. Earlier this year, pundits had chose to dust off their best bird metaphors for the ugliest of reasons. Because as you may recall, on Memorial Day of this year, a bird watcher named Christian Cooper encountered a woman and her dog in Central Park. Her name is Amy Cooper, as all accounts will make a point of mentioning no relation. But you may know her as the Central Park Karen. After Mr. Cooper confronts Miss Cooper about the fact that her Cocker Spaniel was unleashed, the argument escalates and she threatens to call 911. An African-American man is threatening my life, she said. It was the same day as George Floyd's death. Mr. Cooper's video of the incident went viral and quickly became a flashpoint in the unfolding national uproar. Well, you remember. Somehow, the very mild-mannered nature of the hobby, almost a byword to the non-birder world for unthreatening. Benevolent nerdiness, where the most internecine spats center on issues like etiquette of playing recorded bird calls, made the story to the armchair spectator even more shocking. For this most fraught of places, a strange spotlight was thrown on the quiet world of urban birdwatching, and specifically Audubon, New York, of which Mr. Cooper is a board member. The National Audubon Society, of which New York, at 41 years old, is a relatively young chapter, released a statement following the Cooper incident. The outdoors and the joy of birds should be safe and welcome for all people, it read in part. That's the reality Audubon and our partners are working hard to achieve. The public image of bird watchers, of course, is cozy. Elderly, absent-minded professor types in wacky hats disengaged from the real world, perhaps absorbed by the minutia of bird calls and flight paths. Certainly that's an element and an endearing one. As Heinz indicates, birding and certainly the Audubon Society is inextricably tied up with the hard, pragmatic graft of urban conservation work. Whether that means dealing with developers to build bird-friendly structures, agitating for safer wind turbines, or working to make the 9-11 tribute and light less devastating to avian populations. The twin beams of light lure migratory birds off their flight paths. This work, like that of conservation generally, is inherently political. And as such, the recent involvement in real world skirmishes is perhaps less unlikely than it might seem. We're a conservation organization not a birding club, Heinz explains. Birding is a point of entry to conversation. Not all birders are conservationalists, but it really is the gateway. Birding is simple, but it takes decades to master. You need only binoculars and maybe a guidebook, but those binoculars cost money. It's a pastime that calls for certain luxuries, time, and perhaps even more than this, attention. And while the hobby is open to anyone with access to a city park, it can feel clubby to the outsider. The sheer volume of vocabulary, of trivia, of things unknown. That's the appeal to many. To others, it's intimidating. After the Cooper incident, there was much written about the perceived whiteness of the pursuit. A black man in ramble, as seen, will not necessarily be threatened as a lovable eccentric but as an alien threat. But if the incident drew attention to the question, 
Perhaps it can also serve as a means of broadening that very world. Maybe, as with the joys of sourdough baking and the necessity of working from home, some people will discover that they can, in fact, birdwatch. Of course, the same thing that makes birding an ideal quarantine activity, the fact that it's outdoors, largely solitary and meditative, makes it hard to measure in a time when bird walks and after-school programs have been suspended. Then, too, as Christian Cooper tells me, the birding community skews older. So that's the population most likely to avoid public spaces. Especially when the city's park users have been photographed gallivanting with maskless impunity. Like everything right now, it's complicated. According to the Audubon New York City administrators, there has been an uptick in the organization web hits, as well as those of outdoor focused meetup groups like Wild Metro, Latino Outdoors, and Outdoor Afro. In response to the increased interest, Audubon is re releasing its Birding by Subway brochure. The Breeding Bird Atlas, a user generated annual survey, has that unusually high participation. Obviously, the Audubon Society wants to expose as many New Yorkers as possible to nature. The city parks and green spaces are everyone's backyard. There are studies that show that if you are not 10 minutes from a green space, you're too far, says Heinz. And appreciating nature, the evolution of nature, and the value of nature is so important. If you make the green spaces welcoming so everyone can use them, you've done an enormous service to the city and to humanity. But as much as Audubon wants residents to take advantage, says the Jamaica Bay wetlands with its wealth of egrets and herons or the state's many beaches from city dwellers sick of their tiny apartments can be disastrous for nesting plovers. Meanwhile, dogs off their leashes could disrupt the habitat of the parks, native birds, particularly the famously rich population of Central Park. It's easy, especially when emotions are running high, to view it all as a microcosm of the dense city's tensions between population, between needs, between nature and urban life, between solitude and socializing, and of course, between human beings and the planet. Bird as a metaphor, again. Coexistence is tricky. When it works, it's exhilarating. Increasingly, New York, like other cities around the country, has worked with Audubon and other conservative groups to improve conditions for birds. Fresh Kills is a grassland created from landfill, rapidly filling with bird life. In the city's existing parks, native plants, crucial to the supporting of insects and birds, are the rule, with organizations like Staten Island's Greenbelt Native Plant Center encouraging seed collection and planting. New buildings are required to be bird friendly. New York is a city of buildings, and that's not going to change, says Heinz. But we want to see that, going forward, this is a city of bird friendly buildings. New York's glass heavy skyscrapers can prove disastrous for migrating birds, especially young ones that haven't learned to distinguish between glass and the sky it reflects. It doesn't help that what a conservationist might term habitat adjacent also means expensive park view to residents unwilling to disrupt said views with stickers or turn off their lights after dark during migration. But developments like the new Museum of Liberty Island are models of avian-friendly design while a revamp of the Javits Convention Center has cut down on bird collision deaths by 90%. But the pandemic has brought new challenges to this work. It's hard to say at this point what the lasting effects will be on bird populations or habitat. But in the short term, dogs, or more to the point, their owners, have become a thorn in birders' sides as a direct result of the city's lockdown. For one thing, Dog runs are closed, forcing more canines onto the pass. For another, pets that are normally walked by professional dog walkers are now being exercised by fond owners who are more inclined to let them off leash. At the same time, a financially strapped city means fewer rangers to enforce leash laws as more and more New Yorkers try to run along together. Very rich people, of course, can leave the city and have in droves. 
but to those who stay, the parks are not merely a poor man's countryside. It's the very contrast between migratory birds and pigeons, squirrels and rats, and the woodland and skyline, the wilderness hidden in plain sight, that makes for such a piquant experience. In a sense, of course, the experience is more controlled, at least from the elements, and there is a comfort in being able to take a nature bath in the certain knowledge that you can get a warm hat bacon, egg, and cheese on a roll within five minutes. But for New York birders, the appeal isn't just the convenience. In any collection of passionate enthusiasts, one can find conflict. New York's birding community is no different. Indeed, it's a place well suited to the eccentric know-it-alls for whom yelling at strangers is a pleasant bonus. There are tiffs, there are disagreements, there are personality clashes and even occasional Twitter beef. There are villains. On a recent morning walk, I observed two birders arguing over whether it was appropriate to play a recording of a Chimney Swift's call, regarded by many as a breach of birding etiquette in a space as saturated as Central Park. Even the practice of giving rogue unleashed dogs treats, part of what provoked Amy Cooper's ire, is subject of hot debate. But overall, the feeling in the early morning in the ramble is collegial. In the documentary Birders, The Central Park Effect, Christian Cooper lists the qualities that attracted him to birding when he was introduced to it as a boy on Long Island. Along with the beauties of nature and the birds themselves, the pleasures of puzzle solving and scientific discovery, he says, there's the joy of hunting without bloodshed. Cooper has long been active in mentoring other bird watchers. He's in charge of his Feathered Friends After School Bird Club initiative, naturally suspended at the moment. But recently, Cooper has released a comic with DC Comics called It's a Bird, inspired by his notorious encounter in Central Park. In the book, which is also available for free download, a young black birder encounters racism while pursuing his passion. Hashtag birding while black. In the process, the text takes a larger question of police violence, racism, and the pleasure and pain of embracing a passionate hobby. One of the reasons why the protagonist is a young person is to connect with kids, Cooper explains over the phone. He has long worked to bring undeserved communities, particularly young people, to birding, and to help create a world in which a young black man can bird anywhere without encountering suspicion, hostility, or worse. And in the process, can immerse himself in the beauty. Of course, there's a romance to birds because they can fly. And that represents the ultimate freedom. Birders often muse about the first bird that captured their attention. Whether it was a single ruby woodpecker's plumage or maybe the sight of a V of geese flying south impelled by instinct. The combination of macro and micro, inspiring and detailed, Specialized knowledge and general appeal seems crucial to birding's magic. And the courage of migratory birds, combined with the tenacity of local populations, is an ever shifting drama in miniature. It's the controlled chaos of a roller coaster, nature made small enough to create awe without fear. The writer John Franzan has talked about the scale of it, just the right size. All metaphors aside, the magic lies in the birds themselves. Their beauty, their endless variety, their improbable toughness. I'm always struck by the incongruity. These seemingly fragile creatures that can sit on your finger, but can survive incredibly intense conditions, says Winston. They travel from South America to the tundra and back, with just enough body fat and no margin for air. Stopping here in Central Park, and their adaptability is remarkable. The Mountain Gazette Library is produced and hosted by me, John Bustar. For more, head over to mountaingazette.com slash subscribe today and pick up a subscription to the magazine. This podcast is executive produced by Mike Rogge, marketing by Austin Holt, produced by Connor Sedmak, social media by Amy Doran, and public relations by Ryan Rowe. No part of this podcast may be reproduced without written permission from Mountain Gazette and its parent company, Verb Cabin, LLC.